بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We have integral x from 0 to 1 log x over x times the inverse sine of x times the inverse cosine of x. To obtain this integral, we will need also to obtain the integral x from 0 to pi over 2 x times the square of the logarithm of sine of x. Let's start by using the identity the inverse sine of x plus the inverse cosine of x equal to pi over 2. We write this inverse cosine function as pi over 2 minus the inverse sine of x. We split into two integrals. The first integral is equal to pi over 4 integral x from 0 to 1 inverse sine of x d log x squared minus the second integral is one half integral x from 0 to 1 the square of the inverse sine of x d log x squared we do integration by parts when x is equal to 1 log x is equal to 0 and the inverse sine of x is equal to pi over 2 when x tends to 0 from above we need to take the limit applying L'Hopital's rule we can show that the limit as x tends to 0 from above of the inverse sine of x multiplied by log x is equal to 0 if this log x is replaced by the square of log x, we also get 0. Thus, this integral here becomes minus pi over 4 integral x from 0 to 1, the square of log x times the derivative of the inverse sine function, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Minus 1 half this integral becomes 1 half the integral x from 0 to 1, the square of log x times the derivative of this function of x, which is 2 the inverse sine of x over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Consider this integral and do the change of variables t equal to x squared x is equal to t to the power one half log x is one half log t so this part becomes one fourth times the square of log t dx is one half t to the minus one half dt one over the square root of one minus x squared becomes one minus t to the power minus one half this integral is one eighth of the integral t from zero to one t to the alpha minus one one minus t to the power minus one half times log t squared with alpha equal to one half. The function beta of alpha and one half is integral t from zero to one, t to the alpha minus one, one minus t to the power minus one half. We get this integral from beta of alpha and one half by differentiating twice under the integral sign with respect to alpha. The integral of interest is one eighth times the second derivative of beta of alpha and one half with alpha equal to one half. Beta of alpha and one half is gamma of alpha times gamma of one half, which is the square root of pi divided by gamma of alpha plus one half. The first derivative with respect to alpha of gamma of alpha times one over gamma of alpha plus one half is the first derivative of gamma of alpha divided by gamma of alpha plus one half minus gamma of alpha, the derivative of gamma of alpha plus one half divided by the square of gamma of alpha plus one half. Take gamma of alpha over gamma of alpha plus one half as a common factor. Inside the bracket, we get the derivative of the gamma function divided by the gamma function both at alpha minus the derivative of the gamma function over the gamma function, both at alpha plus one half. This is di gamma of alpha. That is di gamma of alpha plus one half. When we differentiated this ratio, we got the ratio times this bracket. If we differentiate again with respect to alpha, we get two terms. The first one is the ratio times the square of this bracket. The second term is the ratio times the derivative of this bracket with respect to alpha, tri gamma of alpha minus tri gamma of alpha plus one half. The tri gamma function is the derivative of the di gamma function. If we set alpha equal to one half, gamma of alpha is gamma of one half, which is the square root of pi. This part is equal to pi over eight. Gamma of one half plus one half is equal to gamma of one, which is one. We need now to obtain the di gamma and tri gamma functions evaluated at one half and at one. This is a series representation of the di gamma function minus a small gamma euler mascheroni constant plus summation over non-negative integer g of one over g plus one minus one over g plus z. If we differentiate with respect to z, we get summation g from 0 to infinity, 1 over the square of g plus z. If z is equal to 1, the summand is equal to 0, di gamma of 1 is equal to minus a small gamma. If we put z equal to 1 here, we get the sum of the reciprocals of the squares of the positive integers. That's zeta of 2 or pi squared over 6. Tri gamma of 1 is pi squared over 6. Tri gamma of 1 half is summation over non-negative integer g of 1 over g plus 1 half multiply upstairs and downstairs by 4, we get 4 summation g from 0 to infinity, 1 over 2g plus 1 squared. This is the sum of the reciprocals of the squares of the positive odd integers. This is zeta of 2 minus 1 over 4 zeta of 2. Tri gamma of 1 half is equal to pi squared over 2. What about di gamma of 1 half? Replace this z by 1 half. 1 over g plus 1 can be written as integral t from 0 to 1 t to the power g. 1 over g plus 1 half is equal to integral t from 0 to 1 of t to the power g minus 1 half. Take t to the g as a common factor. Interchange the order of integration and summation. 
di gamma of one half is minus small gamma plus integral t from zero to one, one minus t to the power minus one half, summation g from zero to infinity, t to the power g. This is a convergent geometric series equal to one over one minus t. Do the substitution, u equal to the square root of t. dt is two u du. This ratio becomes one minus u to the minus one over one minus u squared. u times the numerator is u minus one. The denominator is equal to one minus u times one plus u. This ratio is equal to minus one over one plus u. Di gamma of one half is equal to minus small gamma minus two integral u from zero to one of one over one plus u, which is equal to log two. The integral of interest is this linear combination of these two integrals. We focused on this integral here. We obtained it in terms of di gamma and tri gamma of one and one half. These are the required values. Blogging them in, we get that integral x from zero to one, the square of log x over the square root of one minus x squared is equal to pi times the square of log two over two plus pi cubed over 24. In this other integral, do the change of variables x equal to sine y. When x is zero, y is zero. When x is one, y is pi over two. Y is the inverse sine of x. dx over the square root of one minus x squared is equal to dy. The integrand becomes y times the square of log sine y. The integral of interest is equal to the value of this part multiplied by minus pi over four plus integral x from zero to y over two x times the square of log sine x. If the tangent of x is equal to y, when x is zero, y is zero. When x tends to pi over two from below, y tends to infinity. If tan x is equal to y, then sine of x is equal to y over the square root of one plus y squared. dx is dy divided by one plus y squared. Log y over the square root of one plus y squared is equal to one half log y squared divided by one plus y squared. Squaring both sides, we get one fourth times the square of log y squared over one plus y squared. This is the square of log y squared, which is two log y minus log one plus y squared. Expanding, we get four times the square of log y minus four times the product of the two logarithms plus the square of log one plus y squared. We split into three integrals. For this integral, use the change of variables y equal to one over t. Log y is log one over t, which is minus log t. When we square, we get that the square of log y is the square of log t. The inverse tangent of y is the inverse tangent of one over t. Let's use this identity. For a real positive t, the inverse tangent of t plus the inverse tangent of one over t is pi over two. So replace this inverse tangent by pi over two minus the inverse tangent of t. We now have two integrals, pi over two integral t from zero to infinity, log t squared over one plus t squared. The second integral is exactly this integral here called omega. Thus omega is one half this part. This integral is pi over four integral t from zero to infinity, log t squared over one plus t squared. Use the substitution t equal to the square root of u. The square of log t is one fourth the square of log u dt over one plus t squared becomes one half u to the minus half du over one plus u. This integral can be represented in terms of the beta function. If z1 and z2 have real parts greater than zero, beta of z1 and z2 is integral u from zero to infinity, u to the z1 minus one divided by one plus u all to the power z1 plus z2. Without the logarithm, this integral is beta of one half plus eta and one half minus eta, eta equal to zero. To obtain the square of log u, we differentiate the beta function twice with respect to eta. Then we set eta equal to zero. This beta function is gamma of one half plus eta times gamma of one half minus eta divided by gamma of one, which is one. The reflection rule for the gamma function is that gamma of z times gamma of one minus z is equal to pi times the cosecant of pi z. So gamma of eta plus one half times gamma of one half minus eta is pi times the cosecant of pi times eta plus one half. This is pi secant of pi eta. When we differentiate twice, we get pi squared times pi times pi, that's pi to the power four. The second derivative of the secant function evaluated at zero is equal to one. This integral is equal to pi to the power four over 32. We now have this integral. That one was obtained in a previous video. Its value is in terms of pi, the natural logarithm of two, and the polylogarithm function of order four with argument one half. We still have this integral here. Let's do the change of variables, z equal to one over y. The integral becomes z from zero to infinity, the square of log one plus one over z squared, the inverse tangent of one over z over one plus z squared. We can write the inverse tangent as pi over two minus the inverse tangent of z split into two integrals. 
from the previous page, we know that if we use here z equal to 10x, we exactly get one fourth times this integral. So this integral is equal to this part here divided by two. We still have this integral, which after expanding the square can be split into three integrals. In the first, we have the square of log z. In the second, we have the square of log one plus z squared. In the third, we have the product of log z and log one plus z squared. Write this integral as the sum of two integrals, one from zero to one, and the other from one to infinity. This is written using the dummy variable of integration y. For this integral, do the change of variables y equal to one over z. The limits of integration are now from zero to one. We have this integral in terms of these three integrals. These two are exactly equal. So this integral is two times integral z from zero to one, the square of log z over one plus z squared. Write down this as the integral plus a copy of itself. Write the copy with the variable y. Do the change of variables y equal to one over z. We get an integral with the exact same integrand, but the limits of integration are from one to infinity. These two integrals can be joined together as one integral from zero to infinity. This integrand is exactly this one here. These two integrals are equal. One is multiplied by four, the other by minus four. They go away. The integral on the left-hand side is integral z from zero to infinity, the square of log one plus z squared over one plus z squared. For s between zero and one half, beta of one half and one half minus s is integral t from zero to infinity, t to the minus one half divided by one plus t to the power one minus s. Using the substitution t equal to x squared, beta of one half and one half minus s is equal to two times integral x from zero to infinity, one plus x squared to the power s minus one. If this is differentiated twice with respect to s, the integrand gets the extra factor, the square of log one plus x squared. Going back to our original problem, we are interested in integral x from zero to y over two, x times log sine x squared. This integral itself is equal to the mean integral x from zero to one, log x over x, the inverse sine of x, the inverse cosine of x, plus pi to the power four over 96 plus pi squared log two squared over eight. We are done if we evaluate this integral, which is this one here in the limit as s tends to zero from above. Specifically, integral x from zero to infinity, the square of log one plus x squared over one plus x squared is one half the limit as s tends to zero from above of the second derivative with respect to s of beta of one half and one half minus s. The beta function is equal to gamma of one half, which is the square root of pi, times gamma of one half minus s divided by gamma of the sum, which is one minus s. Here is the first derivative of this ratio with respect to s. If we take the ratio as a common factor, we get inside the bracket, di gamma of one minus s minus di gamma of one half minus s. Differentiating again with respect to s, we get the ratio of the gamma functions times the square of this bracket plus the ratio of the gamma functions times the derivative of this bracket, which is tri gamma of one half minus s minus tri gamma of one minus s. When s tends to zero, this ratio tends to the square root of pi, yet this outside factor pi over two. We also have the square of di gamma of one minus di gamma of one half plus tri gamma of one half minus tri gamma of one. Using our previous results, integral x from zero to infinity, the square of log one plus x squared over one plus x squared is pi cubed over six plus two pi times the square of log two. Multiplying this by pi over 16, we get the integral x from zero to pi over two x times the square of log sine x. If we subtract this bracket, we get the integral of interest.